This week on Sports Pod, the women's soccer team starts a new era of Mac play. Field hockey has a doubleheader this weekend. And volleyball continues tournament play. All this and more coming up right now on, on Sports Buzz. Good evening and welcome back to Sports Pause. I'm Zach Stoganger and alongside me is my fellow Pembroke High School graduate, Brandon Murdoch. Brandon, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic and I'm excited for a great show along and alongside another Pembroke alumni. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be amazing. And we'll kick off. Well, I guess we're going to kick things off right now, Brandon, with uh, women's soccer. Why don't you take it away? Rachel Roman, in the, starting off in the first half, Rachel Roman gets things going on in the fourth minute of this one as Ella Gagno drives into the box and takes a shot blocked by Morgan Cooper, who finishes it for herself. Bob has a strike early to one nothing, and this will be the lead going into the half as the Bobcats celebrate the early goal. Early now, goal so crucial, man. Now heading into the second half, 16 seconds into this one, Courtney Tokel puts one in the back of the net, and the Bobcats celebrate at midfield. The Oakville and the Bobcats extend their lead to 2-0. And there is still celebrating. Have, now, in the 73rd minute, Victoria Foster drives the offensive third, takes down a Sacred Heart defender on the way. Foster takes a shot at the top of the box, barely hits the crossbar, missing the shot. This will keep the game 2-0. Now, as the Bobcats come onto the field celebrating, Kubo and Toko are both scored. The second goal of the those season. Games Meanwhile, where, Sophie. Yeah, you, you know it's going to be on the schedule, playing it first right off the bat, where it's a new start for them. They can come in, emotion, make it an emotion game, make it a physical game. And then, you know, for us, it's trying to deal with that. And then, you know, can we become the team that we're capable of? Bobcats would end up taking this one two to nothing off the back of Copel and Chokel getting. Those goals, great goals there. Los Pinoso also a great performance in that there, Murdoch. Absolutely fantastic performance from the Bobcats there in the MAC opener. After the game, women's soccer beat reporter Connor Kaur talked about the new additions to the MAC. As the Quinnipiac Bobcats and the Sacred Heart Pioneers game kicked off, it was not the start, but rather a restart of a rivalry that dates back more than a decade. Before Quinnipiac joined the MAC, the Bobcats and the Pioneers squared off in the NEC. The series was dominated by Sacred Heart, winning seven games out of the 13 matchups. Fast forward 12 years, the Bobcats are now two-time conference champions and welcome the Pioneers into the MAC Conference. The message is you've got to respect your opponents, but you also have to play with confidence. And, and uh, this year is going to be about learning you know, where, where we fall. I think the two, both the MAC and the NEC were, were comparable in women's soccer, but now you're bringing Merrimack and ourselves over. It's going to be, there are no easy games in the MAC. Like with the Bobcats looking to get a third straight MAC championship, the formula has been simple. It's all about executing the game plan on the field. Because the whole thing we're driving is we're going to score in every game. So to beat us, you're going to have to score twice, which is what we talked about last year. But we've also learned how to win. If you, if you think of our three key wins last year, Mount St. Mary's away, uh, Canisius in the semis and Fairfield, 1-0, 1-0, 1-0, set play, set play, set play. So there's a pattern there. We don't want to keep relying on it, but we know these players know how to win. Thanks to conference realignment and the MAC being a very tight conference, both teams know how every game is important difference between numbers 3 and, and uh, 13 is not very great. So if you have a bad day, you're going you're gonna to have a tough one. Games are always competitive and emotions can always get high. It's the difference between a team that ends up in the middle of the pack and at the top of the food chain. You know, for us, it's trying to deal with that. And then, you know, can we become the team that we're capable of? So I think we dealt with it overall well. So, yeah, it'll be a good rivalry moving forward. Saturday was also the first conference game that any Quinnipiac program has played against the two new schools entering the MAC. Now the Quinnipiac Bobcats will also be taking on the new to the MAC Merrimack Warriors on October 16th at 2.30 here at home. Reporting from the Quinnipiac Soccer and Lacrosse Stadium for Q30 Sports, I'm Connor Core. Connor joined us live to break down what he's seen from the women's soccer team so far. Connor, first off, the Bobcats... 
the follow-up guest attempt at a conference theory peat may have gotten a bit more difficult with the addition of a few more teams. Could you fill us on what's new in the MAC? Yeah, you know, not just in the MAC, but really across the entire country. Conference realignments, team moving from Big 12 to the SEC, you know, moving across the entire country. That's really been the biggest key that we've seen. It's obviously it's a trickle-down effect to the MAC conference. It obviously isn't as huge, like I mentioned, the Big 10, the ACC, all these other schools. But really, it's becoming less and less about amateur sports with the NIL piece as well. Transfer portal acting more and more like free agency. You know, moving conferences to competition, more mo people are moving conferences for more competition. I feel like exactly what happened with Merrimack and Sacred Heart, you know, moving from 11 teams to 13 teams in the MAC. You know, one can make a big assumption that it was had to be a huge basketball decision. You know, that Sacred Heart and Merrimack both coming from the NEC, you don't really see too many, too many of those games on you know, ESPN Plus or ESPN3. We know down in Atlantic City, that championship game for the men's and women's side ends up on ESPN3, so I think it had to be a huge part of it, adding that whole, you know, this revenue stream that we're in these days with college athletics. Now, I want to talk more specifically about you know, why Sacred Heart and Mac probably came in the most part. The MAC put out, back in 2020, their five-year plan strategy, a strategic plan, and like you said, it had plenty of games on ESPN Plus, ESPN3, even having a lot of the conference championships down at the ESPN Wide World of Sports, down all the way down in Florida, which is obviously nowhere near the MAC. The team most furthest south is in Maryland. So that's the biggest thing, I think, the reason they came to the MAC. And, you know, when it comes to these matchups, and especially women's soccer, it'll be the first, it'll be the first matchup for Merrimack in the, against Quinnipiac in women's soccer. Merrimack went 10-4 and four last season, currently 2-4-1 and one so far in these first seven games of the season. And, you know, we mentioned it earlier on, on the rebound on Saturday, which you can check out on Q30 Sports Twitter. Uh, you know, Sacred Heart has previ had previously had 14 matchups with the first matchup on the, in the MAC this past Saturday. Um, but there's really been a domination from Sacred Heart in the NEC days back in, you know, 2012 before Quinnipiac moved to the MAC. But now Quinnipiac's had that 1-0 and so far. So I think really it's been a lot about, you know, you think normal college athletics were just athletics, the money and the re revenue streams and stuff like that. And, you know, it's really about all the athletics and, you know, that's how the Mac's going to be in these next couple of years with Merrimack and Sacred Heart as well. Now, Connor, I want to go back to the first matchup. What did you see between these two squads? Yeah, I mean, coming into the game, Brandon, you and I both talked about it as well, that, you know, we thought it was going to be Sacred Heart's going to be a lot more, you know, be able to control the pace, be able to, you know, play in that midfield. You know, when they beat, George when they only lost to Georgetown 2 nothing, we saw Quinnipiac lose earlier in the season to Georgetown 5 to nothing. we thought, oh, no, this is going to be a good game for Quinnipiac straight out of the MAC and everything like that. But that was far from that. You know, Quinnipiac had a lot of self-inflicted wounds against Georgetown and really couldn't dominate the midfield. They had plenty of chances, but just couldn't quite finish and ended up, uh, Georgetown ended up shutting out Quinnipiac. But when it came to this game this past Saturday, Sacred Heart was really able to just not own the midfield. A lot of what we thought pregame ended up not being true because the um, – because they were just able to dominate the midfield, winning on the goal kicks. Those first and second balls, a combination of El Gagno, Clara Bankston, and Rich Roman. Rich Roman, we'll get to it a little bit later, like we, we've been talking about. But, you know, Sacred Heart just seemed out of funk. And I've seen, I watched in the game on Saturday, there were many points where Los Spinoza was like pretty much at her midfield line because all the possession was all in the Bobcats' final third, being able to put constant pressure on that Sacred Heart back line and really be just dominating the entire game. I think I want to say there's probably like, 70 percent of the possession in the second half was in the Sacred Hearts final third. Los Spinoza obviously making three um, saves, but you know I talked to Matt Micros, the head coach for Sacred Heart, after the game, and he said, you know, you got to respect your opponents and play with a lot of confidence. And when you're going up against the two-time defending conference champions in Quinnipiac, it's a lot. Uh, you know, you have a lot of respect for the teams, but there just didn't seem like there was a lot of confidence for Sacred Heart on Saturday. Certainly. And the Bobcats will have their final non-conference game against LIU on Wednesday. Yeah. Can you take us to what's come after that? Yeah, so it's, obviously it's going to be completely conference games from there on out. They'll have about a 10-day break um, where they'll play Siena on September 21st, where you can see on your screen right now. And then it's at St. Peter's. You know, they got a little bit of a road stretch right there and down in New Jersey. But then it's a home game against Niagara, kind of a rematch of the 2022 um, 2022 MAC championship game where they ended up winning for nothing and up going to Penn State. Don't have to talk about that. Those are two seasons ago now. But you know, what really was the biggest thing for me is that Canisius is always going to be difficult as well. There, you didn't see it on that full screen just before, but you know, in that semifinals last year, it felt like even two years ago as well. It was both one nothing games, extremely close games. Quinnipiac had to capitalize on their set pieces that they had, and that's really the key between being a good team and getting out of the semifinals, being a great team and going to the NCAA tournament for two straight years. You know. 
Matt, I was talking to Mike Gross after the game as well, and he said that, you know, 3 through 13 outside of, you know, Quinnipiac, Fairfield, and Canisius, it's going to be extremely tight. So if you lose one game or, you know, the goal differential is nowhere you want it to, like, kind of like Sacred Heart was, where they lost 2 nothing, it's going to cost you in the long run when you're getting down to those games in late October, early November, when, you know, you have one game before the playoffs and you're on the outside looking in. Top eight teams make the conference tournament. It's going to be huge for those other teams, three, th three through 13, excuse me, that um, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to talk about. And it's for, when you look at Fairfield in specifically, you know, obviously you took a lot, look at Fairfield where they had, you know, one nothing game in the first minutes, felt like, in the championship game. But, you know, outside of those three teams that we mentioned, Canisius, Fairfield, and Quinnipiac, it's really a pack pack for pushing whoever it may be. All right, Connor, we, we love your points here. We need, we just need to have one more question. Yeah. I mean, you look back at the back-to-back -back, uh, championships in the MAC. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Cook, Courtney Chokel, some of these top-line players, yeah. some of these X-factors. Don't anybody know, as anybody knows, especially the Bobcats know back-to-back -back years, who's going to be that X-factor? Who's going to be going down the line? Who are they going to rely on? Who do you think? Yeah, Courtney Choco right now is obviously a grad student. She had five shots on goal against Sacred Heart, so an incredible performance. Was only able to put one away, and let's be honest, that goal that she scored wasn't really a goal. It kind of just deflected off of a leg, but the players who have really stood out to me personally, and I'm sure, Brandon, you pre prefer the same sentiments as well, is starting in the midfield, Rachel Roman. She's a senior right now, came, transferred from Bryant, going into her junior year, and didn't really get a lot of playing time in the last fall because she came into the season with a small injury that kind of limited her playing time. But when she was came in uh, this year, you have that long and athletic frame. She's five foot eight, and one of the biggest question marks that we always had coming into the season was who's going to fill in that uh, that central defensive midfield for Olivia Scott, who played eighty over eighty career games, most ever by a Bobcat. And she's really honestly filled that role nicely. You know, like we mentioned, that long and athletic frame. You know, she does a lot of stuff that don't, you don't see on the stat sheet. You know, making hard tackles, able to switch sides of the field, able to find Morgan Cooper, who we're going to be talking about probably about 30 or 45 seconds from now, that, you know, they're able to push the ball forward and really put pressure on that back line for the other teams, you know, immediately and quite frankly, very often in the MAC this season. You know, we talked about Morgan Cooper, Morgan Cooper as well. Only played four games last year, had a season ending injury. Um, but throughout these last two games, she scored two goals and had a 10 shots on goal as well in these last two games. So really impressive last couple of games for Morgan Cooper. And, you know, when she's playing that center striker, center forward, excuse me, role in that nine, that she's really able to be that person where the, when the Bobcats go on defense and they get the possession of the ball, they can clear it up to her and she's able to lay it off for the midfielders. The midfielders are able to play it out wide and she's eventually going to get on those balls. That's why she's had so much success in these last two games being having 10 shots on goal and getting on most of the most of those balls she very easily could have scored on probably half if not three quarters of the goals that she had in these last couple games all right well connor we appreciate your analysis we could talk all night about i know I women's could. soccer i, could I know you can 30 minutes but if you needed to there was another <laughs> soccer team that was in action it's the men the quinnipiac men's soccer team and they took on st bonaventure this weekend roll the team we got Quinnipiac men's soccer against St. Bonaventure in a non-conference matchup. Bobcats, Bonnies, the Bobcats, one and two starts of the year. They're trying to get another tick in that left-hand column. We're we'll going right to the second half. We got Mo Tall for the St. Bonaventure. He's going to go and find Daniel Halle, his teammate. Halle is going to bring it down that right-hand side. He's going to... He's gonna keep, he's gonna weave, he's gonna find Keegan, Holly, and Dawson, sorry, he deposits it in for the goal. Gets the Bonaventure, save Bonaventure up, one nothing. But we got a corner here and it's Jao Pinto. Put that on ESPN, Jao Pinto. What a beautiful header there. He gets the team hype. That 73rd minute goal ties it at one. Let's head to the 85th, 85th minute. Mechi Akuzuko, what a goal. He gets past the defenders and he his shirt's off. He's going crazy. Save Bonaventure is up two to one. With final minutes here, another long corner. It's not gonna find anybody but it's gonna be Sphere Residalis here the, after the ball bounces around he's gonna get it deflected off a defender final minute here last chance for Quinnipiac it's gonna be uh, Alex Miller here after all this confusion he's gonna fire it last chance but it goes wide that would do it for the Bobcats two to one for St. Bonaventure off uh, Aquazoko and uh yeah, uh, the Aquazoka goal. It was a great goal there, Brandon. It was a fantastic game winner. Now, coming up after the break, the field hockey team celebrated its 30th anniversary, and we'll take you through 
how the weekend home doubleheader went. Also, volleyball headed down to Virginia to compete in the William & Mary Invitational. Another Invitational means another conference test for the Bobcats. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. I'm an ex-drug dealer, and I'll be your sub today. Two milligrams of fentanyl can be lethal. A lethal dose is in here. Who gets it, I won't know. It's cheap, it's potent, and it's profitable. The sad reality is fentanyl is being mixed into everything now. More kitchen now. Everyone has a ritual, that small thing that keeps us focused. A habit we never skip to clear our minds and elevate our performance. But what do you do to keep your head in the game, to drown out that self-doubt and support your mental health? Because being your best isn't just about taking care of your body. It's about taking care of your mind and your mental health. Discover the resources that you need to keep your mind focused and your mental health a priority. Have you ever helped a fellow veteran? Yes. I do my best reaching out to my brothers and sisters in arms. Have you ever asked for help yourself? Most of us, we're not going to admit that we need to help. If you don't have someone to kind of help you guide those thoughts, it can be really bad. It's just a beautiful space when someone can trust you and say, listen, I need help. I don't remember how it started. Not today. Our back and forth. It always came back. Dad! You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Welcome back to Sports Boss, and thank you for sticking with us. The Quinnipiac field hockey team kicked off their doubleheader on, on Friday against UNH. Let's roll the tape. It's going to be the UNH Wildcats against the Quinnipiac Bobcats in the first of a doubleheader for the Bobcats at home. Let's head to the second quarter as Brecken Calchieri is going to go into the crease for UNH. And she's going to dribble past. She's going to find Tasmin Cookman for the goal who gets it right past Christina Torres. Let's take a look at it again. What a shot there. Tasmin Cookman, great deflection. Gets the Wildcats up one. Let's head to the third. Faye Mayer here is going to go into the crease, but Christina Torres pulling up, putting a show on for the goalie. She would have six saves on the day. But later in the third, Addison McNeil would go inside the crease. She'll get it past Torres for the goalie. Wildcats go up two there. Uh, you know, Brandon, it was a great, it was, uh, UNH really had a great offense today. But let's head to the fourth quarter. Faye Meyer is going to go along the back line. She's going to somehow not step out of bounds, and she finds her teammate there for another goal. That is Kathleen Nattel for her second of the year. Really well executed play there. And now Carly Worms is going to take the ball away from the Bobcats. It's going to be Tasmine Cookman who ends up with her second of the day. That would be the score for nothing. Wildcats against the Bobcats, Brandon. I mean, Bobcats really couldn't get anything going to them. Yeah, nothing on the offensive end, and there was really no stop in these Wildcats. There was really no answer from the Bobcats in this one. Field mm -hmm. Hockey also had a match against Stonehill on Sunday, looking to bounce back. Now the Bobcats, the second game of this weekend doubleheader against Stonehill on Alumni Weekend. We take, take a look at both teams lined up on midfield waiting for the pregame festivities. We'll head right into the first quarter as Martina Calvera attempts a shot but is blocked off the stick of TMA Harlow. Now in the second quarter, a Stonehill penalty corner as they fail to find the back of the net through the Bobcats defense here being there to protect the goal, keeping them scoreless. Now heading into the fourth as TMA Harlow passes the ball to Nadine Jansen but Katie Shanahan and Mo Quayle double team her to make her stay put in her place and keep from getting forward. Now as we head into overtime, TMA Harlow runs out of trouble and makes a pass to Tyra Stark as she almost runs the entire way home, but the Bobcats defense is there to ultimately make this stop. Great defense. Really, there is something we didn't see on Friday against TMA Harlow. Certainly. And now further in overtime, Lucy Pompeo gets by a stone defender and the goalie to find the back of the net for the game winner, securing the win. 
for the Bobcats, one nothing in this one. Brandon Pompeo there, what a clutch gene she's got. She's able to get it past a few defenders. Such a huge victory for the program in its 30th anniversary game. Certainly need a player to step up, and Pompeo was that person. One goal, it was the game-winning goal with six shots in this one. A huge turnaround from Friday's game where they gave up four goals in that one. Well, Brandon, the Bobcats went one and one on the weekend, but this weekend meant a little more to the program. Certainly, field hockey beat reporter Brittany Brunleben has the story. Head coach Nina Klein explained the importance of having former head coach Becca Mean back cheering them on the sidelines and the importance of having alumni show up to the game and showing their support today. Field hockey alumni explain the emotions they felt coming back to the stadium and watching the Bobcats get their first win on the special day. The Quinnipiac field hockey team and the alumni will continue to celebrate the 30th season as a huge accomplishment. The bond they share will only grow throughout the years. Reporting for Q30 Sports, I'm Brittany brown -Lieben. The Quinnipiac volleyball team will continue their non-conference slate at the William & Mary Invitational. The Bobcats will take on the George Mason Patriots on day one, and the Bobcats will ultimately fall to the Patriots in four sets. Alina Giacomini will lead the team in kills. Chloe Kawanui will barely beat Adama Ganesh in assists, while Hawaii Kim Sai Moy and Ilana Kejusta will lead the team in digs. The Bobcats will look ahead to day two to turn around the weekend. Unfortunately, Brandon, though, it wouldn't go too well for the Bobcats on day two, as I mean, it would not, uh, the Bobcats would end up falling to the host William & Mary in four sets. I mean, they could only get really set two out of there. The big story of the game, though, Chloe Kawanui having 39 assists in the game in the 3-1 to one loss. There would be no rest for the Bobcats as they would take on Bucknell that same afternoon. But the Bobcats struggled against the Bison as well. They were able to keep the first set close, falling 26-24, uh, falling to 24, but it was all Bucknell after that. The Bison won two sets to 20, two, two sets to 25 to 19 and blew Quinnipiac out of the water. Man, that was a really great one there. I mean, it really was a tough weekend for the Bobcats. Yeah, certainly a, a tough weekend sweep and, uh, in Virginia there. Well, it's time to our head to our final break of the night, but we've got some news about some women's ice hockey alums playing in Team Canada's development camp. Also, Zach, we've got the most electrifying part of the night. Well, what is that, Brandon? Well, it's the top five plays. You're not gonna, don't go anywhere. Sports Pause will be right back.
done the hard part. You quit smoking. Now do the easy part and get scanned for lung cancer. If you smoked, you may still be at risk, but early detection could save your life. Talk to your doctor and learn more at savedbythescan.org. It's a dad. Every day is a challenge. To make sure that the time that I have, I spend with them. It doesn't matter how tired you are. You have to try and to teach them. When they learn something new, and you can just see in their faces, it's, it's such an incredible moment. It's those moments that are, that are my favorite. Everyone has a ritual, that small thing that keeps us focused. A habit we never skip to clear our minds and elevate our performance. But what do you do to keep your head in the game, to drown out the self-doubt and support your mental health? Because being your best isn't just about taking care of your body. It's about taking care of your mind and mental health. Discover the resources you need to keep your mind focused and your mental health a priority. We are taught, you don't talk about your problems with nobody because you could get in trouble. And I've been in trouble. Anxiety, depression, sexual assault. When I decided to get help, my life changed. And the mental health box, that was one of the big tools. Accepting help means that we're allowing somebody to bless our life. It's freeing. We got stronger together. Love your mind. Welcome back to Sports Pause, folks. The rugby team took a trip down to Cambridge this weekend to take on the defending national champions, Harvard. And for the second game in a row, they tied. Quinnipiac thought they were about to get their first win against the Crimson since 2013 when Cat Story found the try zone with only 11 minutes and 30 seconds left. However, Lennox London was able to get into the try zone for Harvard as time expired to tie things up at 20. The tie put an end to Crimson's 10 win match winning streak, and Quinnipiac will look for their first win next week at the Naval Academy down in Maryland. All right, well, the women's tennis team, they're a spring team, but they have begun prep for their season as they hosted hidden duels over the weekend. The Bobcats had preseason matches against St. Francis and in-state rivals UConn and Fairfield after a year where they went 10-12 and 12 in in-season and a MAC Conference championship berth. The Bobcats are aiming for another great season on the new blue courts. Softball has a new face in the dugout as they have hired Sydney Cernerkia to their coaching staff as an assistant coach. Cernerkia was spent last season as a graduate assistant at the Division III level for Rutgers and Newark University. While there, Cernerkia works closely with the pitching staff as well as all aspects of team operations. Cernerkia, a former pitcher for St. Peter's, will look to use her experience to lead the Bobcats back to the playoffs. She's also a local of North Branford, Connecticut, and a standout high school player. Great pickup there for the softball team. Well, the summer weather is still around. It's nothing like a little hockey to cool you down. One current and three former women's ice hockey players for the Bobcats are heading to Calgary in September for the national team camp. Grad student Ken, uh, Kendall Cooper will be joined by former Bobcats in the pros. Lexi Agia of the Boston Fleet, Emma Woods of the Toronto Scepters, and Kareen Schroeder of the New York Sirens will join Cooper in Calgary to work on the game and compete for, the te for Team Canada. Hey Zach, check your watch. It's time for the best part of the show. You know what, Brandon, it is. It's time for top five plays. Let's get it. Play number five. It might be fall, but tennis is back in Hamden. And first year, Willow Renton hits an amazing over-the-shoulder shot. The returning shot would go wide, and she wins the point. Let's take another look at that pure strength to get that ball over the net. Well, Brandon, it's great to see freshmen doing well. Number four, we got Fodela Nibralin, as she kicks it right through on the penalty conversion. Bobcats would draw the Crimson 20 all. Now play number three, women's soccer in action for Sacred Heart. Ella Gagno puts a shot on net, but it's off her teammate Morgan Kupo, who collects the rebound and scores. Take another look at this. Kupo in the right place at the right time. Bobcats win 2-0. Great positioning there by Kupo. Number two, though, Alex Miller in the corner for Yao Pinto. Beautiful header there, Brandon. That's a galactical goal for me. Great goal there. Who doesn't like a tie and goal off a corner kick? Oh, my God, look at that. Yao Pinto, beautiful form, beautiful execution. Gets up for that one. Now it's the number one play on the Astro turf. Lucia Pompeo makes a beautiful move around her defender. 
and she snipes this one past the goalkeeper to walk it off in double overtime. Just a beautiful move to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the field hockey team. It sure is, The Bobcats win this one one to nothing. Now, that's all we've got tonight on Sports Pause. Thank you all so much for staying with, with us. And thank you to the producing staff and everyone behind the scenes for making this show possible. Make sure to follow us on Q30 social media. You can find us on Instagram, X, and TikTok, and Q30 Television, and visit the website for more content, Q30.com. Also, be sure to follow us at Q30 Sports on X and Instagram to stay up to date on all our favorite Quinnipiac teams. I'm Brandon Murdoch. He's Zach Stokinger. Signing off. Good night, Bobcats.